thank you all for joining us. I'm Candace Shively with Utah State University Extension, and we also have Satal Puyal joining us, who is also from USU. We are both associated with USU Center for Water Efficient Landscaping, which is the organization that supports these events. This month, we have Dr. Kelly Cope joining us. She's our USU Extension Turf Grass and Water Conservation Specialist, and she's also the director of the Center for Water Efficient Landscaping. Uh, today, she is going to discuss just how resilient turf grass is. She's going to cover some management practices, including pesticide use, nutrient management, irrigation, among some other things that can help improve the drought tolerance and resilience of the turf grass areas. So with that, I will turn it over to Kelly. Thanks, Candice, very much. And welcome, everyone. I'm happy to be with you again. It's always a lot of fun um, to participate in these webinars. So the title today, How Low Can You Go? It's really sort of a tongue-in-cheek <laughs> approach to turf grass management during some pretty challenging weather conditions and climate conditions that we're facing right now. So as Candace said, I'm going to be talking about a lot of different aspects of turf grass management, um, but I generally start out by introducing the topic a little bit. And of course, for those of you who... Um, Certainly, those of you who live in the central and southwest, central west, southwest states of the US, you're very well aware of our current drought conditions. And as you can see here, just indicated by the, the darker colors, there is a, a large portion of the country right now that is experiencing um, extreme drought. Now, here in Utah, we are definitely uh, one of those locations. We have areas. Um, under exceptional drought, extreme drought, every part of our state is experiencing some for some um, aspect of drought with some different severity. And we're also dealing now with a lot of impacts. And these impacts aren't exclusive to Utah, but these are the ones that we are dealing with most. We're dealing with um, increased fire risk. We are having plant and wildlife impacts. Um, relief response and restrictions. So in particular, water use restrictions are occurring here. It's affecting our tourism and recreation industries and of course, um, overall water supplies and in addition, water quality are of concern. So it's certainly top of mind for everyone. Um, I was doing a little checking into it and we the drought that we are currently experiencing is the worst that we have experienced in the past 1200 years. So definitely an issue, something that we have to um, address. Um, in terms of plants and drought and turf grasses, that's what I'm primarily focusing on here today and drought. What happens when they are exposed to drought is that every single plant process is affected. Growth is slowed down. Um, there can be in, increased reflectance of sunlight from the leaves, increased leaf temperature, of course. There can also be some other compounding factors like decreased nutrient uptake, and there can be mineral accumulation in leaves, which can also affect the overall ability of the plants to withstand, withstand stress. So there's a whole lot of things going on with plants that are living under drought conditions. So with all of that as an introduction, I wanted to just outline what I'm gonna be talking about today and, and put it in the context of an integrated pest management approach because we can talk a lot about managing turf grasses under drought conditions and pe people often think that the focus there is on irrigation and it is on irrigation but it also has to do with our other general management practices. And in particular, what happens when we try to manage pests, whether it's insect pests, disease pests, what have you, weeds um, under drought conditions. So I've got this organized in terms of things that can be done before drought, during drought, and after drought. And I'll talk in more detail about all of those different aspects. So, you know, at this point, we're in August, um, and so we're at least in Utah, we're already through the hottest part of our summer. So this is maybe more um, advisory for, for next summer or for uh, future drought situations. But there's so much that can be done before drought so that when drought does occur, you're in a better position. Namely, one of the first things that can be done is to implement integrated pest management. And I'm not going to get into great detail on integrated pest management, although I will recommend certain practices. But basically, it's using different management strategies 
and the judicious, I want to emphasize the word judicious there, use of pesticides to prevent, reduce, and potentially eliminate pests. So a lot of things happening in conjunction with other one another, identifying pests, um, monitoring for those pests, and then using different tactics to address them so that they are either eliminated or kept at a level that is not damaging to the plants. So some of these things can be done in different parts of the year. In the springtime, we focus on doing things in turf areas like raking out dead areas, reseeding thin or bare areas, applying certain pest controls, um, including crabgrass and winter annual weed controls. And then one of the primary ones, at least in our region, is monitoring for white grubs and applying control where it is warranted. Um, now, I don't have time today to get into all of the details that I would normally share about addressing and, and managing for white grubs, but we do here in Utah have a lot of extension resources that you can access to find that information. And this is also going to be true in other states. And you can access this type of information often through your land grant university. But this is just an example here in Utah. So those are spring IPM things that we focus on. And then as the season goes on, you can continue monitoring for certain pests. So white grubs, yes, but then we start layering in some other pest monitoring. In our case, for example, we often get bluegrass billbug occurring in later spring. And so that would be our next focus in terms of spring integrated pest management. And again, we do have resources to support folks in our state and region actually for their management. And that is likely the same for you too in your locations. Um, I don't think I mentioned it, but I do want to make sure to mention that this presentation is a summary form of a much larger presentation that does include a lot of details on this pest management. And so at the end of the presentation today, I'm going to um, have my email on that last slide. And if you're interested in that more extended presentation, I'm very happy to share that if you reach out to me afterward. All right, so also in terms of late spring integrated pest management, that's a time when we start thinking about certain weeds in our turf grass areas. In particular, crabgrass becomes an issue, and so we start to monitor for that and consider treatment. Now, having said that, one of the most important things I want to share today is are the considerations that should be made when you're using herbicides during drought conditions. Um, during drought conditions, what we find is that herbicides are much less effective on those weeds. Um, and in addition, they may actually damage stressed turf grass. And so that's something that you really have to keep in mind when deciding whether or not to treat with herbicides on drought stressed turf. So there is a rule of thumb that I often share with folks, and that is that if the turf is 50% green or more, then it's likely okay to apply those herbicides. But if it is less, then you should really wait. Um, and you might consider hand pulling or spot mowing those areas. Uh, and you certainly don't wanna be using herbicides at high temperatures. And I'm gonna describe the reasons for that um, as I go. But there's some other things to consider as well. During drought conditions, when it is very hot, there is a higher chance of drift when spraying herbicides. And of course, that is something we always want to avoid because we are targeting certain species, not others. And so we don't want to be applying herbicides or pesticides of any sort under conditions where they may drift easily. They're also more subject to volatilization, so essentially evaporating and becoming uh, into the atmosphere and not doing what they're supposed to be doing. And many herbicides and pesticides depend on moisture to be taken up, whether it's by a plant or an insect or a fungus. And so if there is a lack of moisture, as you would have during a drought, that can mean that they don't break down as they should, that they might persist longer in the soil or on the plants than they would normally. So that's something to consider. Um, in addition, the time of the application should be considered, but not only the actual time of application, but what's going to be happening in the 48 hours after the application. Because if it's going to become extremely hot or extremely dry during those 48 hours, then you have to consider that as well. Um, some other recommendations would be choosing products that are less likely to drift or volatilize. 
um, not spraying particularly where there might be sensitive areas nearby. And then some practical things that you can do. There are nozzles out there that can reduce drift when you're applying pesticides. There are nozzles that apply them in larger droplets, so they're more likely to stay in place as opposed to drifting. There are spray adjuvants that can be included in mixtures with herbicides and pesticides to keep them in place. And of course, and I think this is, is um, uh, common sense, but I think bears repeating always, and that is avoiding peak heat and wind when you're applying these products. Those are all things that have to be considered. And I think the last thing I wanna add here is that when you're using a product a pesticide product, an herbicide product, a fungicide product, what have you. Oftentimes on the label, there will be guidance in terms of temperature and what temperature you should stop applying pesticides. So I'm thinking on the high end. So for example, certain herbicides you're not meant to apply above 85 degrees Fahrenheit. And they all have that kind of guidance that should be considered. Okay, so moving on to summer now, um, essentially in the summertime, we are still monitoring in an integrated pest management approach. We are still monitoring for all sorts of pests. In our case, we are dealing more and more with chinch bugs. Um, we are dealing quite a bit with sod webworm, as well as occasionally Japanese beetle, which is a ubiquitous pests all over the US. Um, and so as we enter the summer months, we have to be looking for those pests. And we do have, again, some supporting materials through USU Extension for these insect pests that are very commonly seen in our turf grass areas. And those should be available to you wherever you may be as well. So in the fall, we have to start thinking about different things. Um, we may have seen increased pest activity during the summer because of drought. Um, we may have seen some significant damage to turf areas because of drought, but in the fall, things tend to start cooling off. We can start to get improved moisture conditions, and we can start to think about renovating or reseeding turf grass areas. Um, it's a perfect time to do so, particularly with our cool season grasses, and we begin planning for that in the fall. Now, related to that, I want to talk about a couple of different programs that we are participating in. We here at USU and in the Center for Water Efficient Landscape do extensive turf grass species and variety trialing. And that is because we know that even under drought conditions, if turf grass is used in a functional slash recreational manner, that can be appropriate as long as it's managed appropriately. It can be, it can still be uh, managed with great water use efficiency. But to achieve that, we have to be able to utilize species and varieties that perform well under drought conditions, species and varieties that are going to use the least amount of water while still accomplishing the function that they are meant to accomplish. And so we participate, as I said, in many, many different programs for trialing different species and varieties. These are some of the organizations that we participate with, um, in particular, the Turf Grass Water Conservation Alliance and the Alliance for Low Input Sustainable Turf. They're very focused on low water use grasses and developing low water use grasses. Um, the National Turf Grass Evaluation Program and the United States Golf Association are also starting to do more and more of that type of work as well. Um, and without getting into too much detail about all of those various programs, I did just want to touch on the types of testing we do when we work with those different organizations. So we might test chronic drought stress where we're still irrigating on a regular basis, but it, does a, it is at a decreased level. So perhaps 50% of what we might normally do. We also conduct trials where we're implementing acute drought stress, meaning we simply stop irrigating and we don't irrigate again until the absolute best performing grass reaches 25% green cover. Everything else might be completely dormant, but we wait until the very best performing grass reaches that 25% green cover. And so these two approaches allow us to identify species and varieties that work well. Um, and so related, I wanted to give a practical example of how that information might be used. Uh, we cooperate with Salt Lake City Department of Public Utilities on a project called a Turf Trade Project. 
And this is a public-private partnership that we have been participating in with the city, as well as the Turfgrass Water Conservation Alliance. Um, we developed a customized seed blend for the city that they provide at cost to their residents. And that mixture is comprised of proven low water use varieties of grass. And so the annual irrigation requirement is vastly reduced. Um, this past year, this is some of the promotional materials for the program. This past year, we actually converted one of the cities. Um, this is actually a municipal pump water pump station in the city, but we converted an existing turf area to these low water use um, species and varieties. And so we went through that process. You can see an aerial view here. Um, and we went through the process by mowing the existing turf very, very short. We used a non-selective herbicide to spray it out. And then we overseeded with the new improved varieties in September of 2021. And frankly, I have to tell you, I was a little concerned with that timing um, because we're, we're never exactly sure when we're going to get our first frost, but we were hoping to have at least six weeks for the new seed to germinate before that first frost. So seeding at the end of September was a bit risky as far as I was concerned. Um, once we did do that seeding, we top dressed with compost just to create, keep some moisture in the seed bed. And what we found was within the uh, following six weeks, we had really great establishment. Everything was um, looking terrific and it still is. And so that program is going on in Salt Lake City now. And it is as a result of some of the trialing that we've done with USU. All right, so moving a bit away from IPM at this point, I wanna talk about other things that can be done before drought conditions occur. Um, optimizing and testing irrigation systems is one of the primary things that can be done. And um, a number of different things can be taken care of when regular maintenance occurs. So sprinklers that are malfunctioning can be replaced or fixed. Sprinklers can be adjusted so that they're spraying where they are supposed to be spraying. Other things can be taken care of, like matching precipitation rates, matching nozzles, even matching brands, if that is um, not the case currently. Um, and then poor design, poor de poorly designed irrigation systems may be adjusted if that is practical. And so that can help with optimizing the irrigation system as you go into the irrigation season so that the best, most efficient use can be made of the water that's available. And I want to qualify all of this by saying this would still be within the constraints of whatever irrigation restrictions or guidelines might be in place where you are. Um, another program that we have here in Utah and that is also available in much of the Western US is the Qualified Water Efficient Landscaper Program. And I mentioned this in relation to optimizing um, irrigation systems because it is a program that really focuses on managing landscapes and irrigation systems efficiently. Um, it covers irrigation auditing, system maintenance and troubleshooting. And so I would just encourage you if you are in the Western United States and in particular, if you are a landscape contractor of some sort to check this out. It's a fantastic certification to have um, and it is actually an EPA water sense certification as well. Some of the other things related to irrigation system optimization to consider, um, there are a number of really effective irrigation technologies out there these days. And over the years, we have participated in a lot of trialing and testing of those products, including different types of irrigation controllers, including weather-based irrigation controllers, as well as Wi-Fi enabled irrigation controllers. And um, in both cases, what we have done is test these controllers on what a traditional landscape might look like. So it would include a turf area as well as ornamental plantings. It might include overhead irrigation as well as drip irrigation, but that is the type of system that we test these controllers on. Um, in the case of the climate-based controllers, we've tested a Rainbird ESP LX modular series with an ET manager cartridge. Uh, we've tested the Hunter Solar Sync. We've also tested a Weathermatic series controller. And then we also include as a control, um, a standard manually programmed Hunter XC400. 
For the Wi-Fi enabled controllers, we've tested Orbit's Beehive controller, Rachio's Smart Sprinkler controller, and we also tested um, the SkyDrop Halo Smart controller with the same Hunter as uh, for comparison against all of those. And to sum it all up, I just will share that with the weather-based controllers, we found significant savings ranging from 37 to 48%, depending on the controller. Um, and with the Wi-Fi enabled controllers, also significant savings ranging from 29 to 55%, depending on the type of controller. So these are very effective. Um, they do require pretty significant programming depending on the controller, and that I think is an area of work that I'm considering looking into in the future, how we help folks take best advantage of this technology. So we're looking at that. All right, so moving on, choosing drought-resistant plants and varieties. I did already mention um, some of the drought-resistant turf grass plants and varieties. Uh, but there are also other landscape plants out there, of course, and we want to choose those as well, choose them for their water use efficiency. So um, actually, I might invite my colleagues to tall at the end to chime in on this, but we do also in the Center for Water Efficient Landscaping participate in ornamental plant trialing. So we do a lot of turf grass trialing and we do a lot of ornamental plant trialing and that is expanding as well. Uh, and I would encourage you, particularly if you are in our area, to visit some of the demonstration gardens in areas that are out there. So the USU Botanical Center, for example, um, the Conservation Garden Park at Jordan Valley Water Conservancy District. Uh, there are others, the Greater Avenues Water Conservation Demonstration Garden in Salt Lake City, Red Butte Gardens in Salt Lake City, uh, the Red Hills Desert Garden, which is in St. George, several others as well. And USU Extension is also a good resource for this type of information. But of course, we are not the only extension service in the country. There, those exist in every state, and I'd encourage you to contact uh, yours to help choosing some of these plants. So um, lastly, before drought, we can recommend testing soil and using water-wise planting practices. This is a real key to drought avoidance in landscapes, whether it's turf grass we're talking about or ornamental plants, regardless. An adequate soil condition is going to improve the plant's abilities to handle drought conditions. And so inspecting soils, making sure there is an adequate depth of topsoil, that's probably the number one problem that I see, at least in this region, improving them if at all possible. So in our case, that can include things like um, adding organic materials because we tend to have low organic matter content soils, um, improving the depth, et cetera. In terms of water-wise planting practices, there are some basics here. And again, I do have a lot more information in the full presentation, but planning is of course key, I think, to everything in life, <laughs> not just landscape management. Um, but planning is of course going to be very, very helpful using practical or functional turf grass areas. I recently um, heard turf grass areas referred to as function or recreational rather. And I thought that was a good way to think about it as well. Um, if the turf grass is being used for some purpose and it's often recreation, then that is an appropriate use of that plant material. Improving soils, we discussed selecting appropriate plants. Um, mulching, that's one of the top things that can be done in terms of retaining soil moisture. Mulching bare soils can help maintain soil moisture on site. Um, irrigating efficiently, which can be helped with climate-based controllers, Wi-Fi enabled controllers, or a good healthy understanding of plant water requirements. And then one of the things I think is sometimes overlooked at least is maintenance. And um, maintaining the plants, pruning as appropriate, removing some that aren't working, moving things around and changing things, that is also all going to help in terms of being water-wise with our landscapes. Now, there's some other things that can be done more specifically for turf grass in terms of preconditioning the grass for drought conditions. So one of the things is encouraging as much root growth, as much rhizome growth and stolen growth as possible, because all of those things are going to give a grass plant more resilience. Um, one of the things that takes place on our university's campus is a very aggressive aeration and top dressing program. And that's not always practical in every case, 
But in the case of our university, they have made very good use of those practices and done incredibly well in terms of maintaining the quality of the turf grass areas on our campus, as well as reducing um, the overall irrigation amount. Reducing compaction, which is done with aeration as well, is incredibly important. And then irrigating to impose mild drought stress before we actually get into the heat of the summer is another way to approach it. And this is a really important one, not over fertilizing. So we want to be adequate with fertilization because it helps with turf grass resilience and recovery. Um, but we don't want to over fertilize because it actually causes the grass to use more water. So during drought, we want to be monitoring for signs of stress, not over fertilizing, as I say, and not over watering. And in fact, it's counterintuitive. But when grasses do start to enter dormancy, so that straw yellow color that you can see there, that's actually a time when you really want to avoid overwatering because it can actually stress the grass even further. And again, that's very counterintuitive for most folks. They see that color and they want to apply more water because they think it's going to be helpful when in fact it isn't. And if traffic can be limited, that's also helpful. Um, with ornamental plants, you can be looking for leaf dropping and scorching, wilting, yellowing, um, footprinting in the cases of turf grasses or ground covers. Those can all be signs of drought stress. And then in terms of turf grass management during drought, irrigating in the morning if at all possible, checking the root depth, making sure that that's adequate, and then taking steps to increase that if at all possible avoiding over irrigation. As I mentioned, that's something people often want to do during drought, but it can be counterproductive. There can be um, increased disease incidents. You can actually get something called wet wilt, which is wilting due to over irrigation. And so something that can be done is um, in terms of irrigation is syringing, which really just means applying a very small amount of irrigation. And it's really only meant to cool the temperature at the surface. It's not really meant to put enough water down so that it's penetrating the soil and going way down into the root zone. It's really simply meant to cool the surface and the leaf temperature. And then you can monitor the crowns of the grass plant, which you see there noted, and I'm not, can you see my arrow, Candace? Yes, yes. Thanks, Sita. So right here, this is the crown of the grass plant, and that's something that you can monitor over time just to simply make sure the plants are still alive if it's of concern. Because oftentimes when people see yellow grass, they think it's dead, um, but really the plant is just protecting the crown, and so you can monitor that over time. Another really good practice is mowing high. Um, it's something that is going to improve the environmental stress tolerance of grasses. Um, it's something that we recommend very, very often. And um, what it also does is help to suppress weeds. So that's part of an integrated pest management practice. It facilitates deeper rooting and it actually provides more photosynthetic area. So longer leaves mean more photosynthetic area. Um, after drought, um, we're not quite there here in Utah yet, but we're getting there. You can assess the damage, aerate, fertilize with care, still don't overwater at this point. Um, and hopefully you will have been mulching the clippings throughout the growing season. And this might be the time to make a plan for renovation. Uh, so I did also just want to share some drought related studies that we have been conducting here at USU. The first of which we implemented last summer, and this was an infrequent irrigation during drought study. And so this is an was conducted on an existing stand of bluegrass, and it had been established from sod, but we had nine plots, and they either received a quarter inch, a half inch, or one inch of irrigation water per month during the growing season. And that was applied during one application. So if you can consider a quarter inch of irrigation applied once per month through the entire growing season last summer, as well as the other treatments. So that's what we implemented. Um, and you can see here in August, everything was very, very dormant. But in September, as the temperature started to cool, things started to recover. And that recovery kept going. These yellow boxes are around the plots that received one inch of irrigation per month. And so in this case, we had just about full recovery. The others, maybe not quite so much. 
Um, but we did have decent recovery at the end of the growing season, but it also got us thinking about what might enhance that recovery and what kind of um, other research we could do, which I'll get into here in a minute. But I wanted to just also show um, this, this depiction of the data that we collected from this study. So this dashed line indicates an acceptable level of green cover in the turf grass. And at the beginning of the season, every one of these treatment plots was fairly close to that acceptable level of cover. It declined a lot during the midsummer, but then at the end of the summer, everything again was getting on average close to that acceptable amount of cover. But again, we were still considering what could we do to improve this process? What could we do to enhance turf grass resilience and recovery? So we also conducted a study in which we looked at different nitrogen rates under very much reduced irrigation levels. So in this study, we had a range of fertilization rates ranging from one pound per thousand square feet to six pounds per thousand square feet of nitrogen fertilizer. And then we were only irrigating at 50% of evapotranspiration and that was being applied twice per week. So that's still a very reduced level of irrigation, but we were considering now what happens with increased fertilization. So here you can see in June, things were quite dormant and you can't tell a lot of difference between the plots, but then things recovered as we went through the summer. Um, by August, we were starting to see really good recovery, particularly with the higher fertilization rates. So the yellow boxes are around the plots that were receiving six pounds of nitrogen per thousand square feet. And then by September, things were really looking very similar and we had complete recovery of all the plots. So this is similar to what I showed you before with the minimal irrigation study, but this dashed line indicates the level of acceptable green cover and our plots were all at that level before the study. They were all below that level in the middle of the summer, but they all increased and actually got even better after the study uh, rather once things cooled down and there was some adequate moisture. And so what we learned from this is that even at vastly reduced irrigation amounts, fertilization can help these grasses recover quite well after the heat of the summer has passed. So we're going to be continuing these infrequent irrigation studies this year. Um, we're going to continue promoting the use of low water use plants and turf grass varieties. And I'm thinking more about the best fertilizer rates for recovery, particularly after extended dormancy. And then in response to questions that I've been getting from industry folks, from landscape managers, municipal folks, uh, I think we're going to start considering weed incidents and in management. That seems to be, at least in our region, the biggest issue that we're facing when we're managing turf grasses under drought conditions. We seem to have increased weed incidents. And so our research questions are starting to formulate around what can we do to address that so that we can maintain the functionality of the turf grass. So we um, conduct a lot of research, but we do it with the support of many different organizations in the state that you see listed here, several of the water conservancy districts, as well as the Division of Water Resources and our USU Extension Service. Um, and just quickly, I wanted to share these resources with you as well, if you'd like to have more information. Um, but with that, I'll wrap it up. And there is my email address. And you're welcome to reach out if you'd like a copy of the more expanded presentation or even this presentation as well. So I'll wrap it up there. Awesome. Thank you, Kelly. You're welcome. Um, so for those uh, that need to duck out, there is going to be a survey that auto generates in your browser. If you could complete that survey and give us some feedback, we'd really appreciate it. Um, and let's get to questions. If you guys could use the Q&A box, it just helps me keep track of things, stay a little more organized. Um, okay, can you speak a little bit more about the low water use turf grass varieties and where people could find those for that Salt Lake City program that you mentioned? Sure, sure. So um, if you happen to live in Salt Lake City, you can reach out to the Salt Lake City Department of Public Utilities. Um, they can share more about that program and put you in touch with the folks managing that program. Stephanie Dewar is the water conservation manager for the city. Um, as far as more generally and, and how folks can access that information. So 
I mentioned a couple of organizations that we have participated with in terms of trialing. So one is the Turf Grass Water Conservation Alliance, and another is the Alliance for Low Input Sustainable Turf. Both of those organizations have websites where you can access information on varieties that have been certified. And when I say varieties that have been certified, what I mean is that they are varieties that have been tested by universities like USU across the country to see what works best where. It's very dependent on where you are in the country, but they do they are listed on their websites. Um, we also have an extension fact sheet out of USU where we identify some of those varieties. So I would encourage you to check that out as well. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, we have a very observant attendee. So one of your slides mentioned that you have done some research on daytime versus nighttime watering application. Ah, I forgot to do <laughs> that. Okay, so let me just first say that that research was led by my colleague, Dr. Melanie Stock. And um, so I think this person may have seen that before somewhere or heard about it. Um, so that research involved comparing daytime irrigation versus nighttime irrigation of turf grass as well as zinnias, so annual flowers. And I will just share the preliminary results and encourage you to reach out to Dr. Stock for the final results, although I think she's still um, doing some final analysis, which is why I didn't want to share any of it. But um, essentially what she has found so far is that there is not a difference in terms of daytime versus nighttime watering, which flies in the face of conventional recommendations. You've often heard, don't water during the day, there's too much evaporation, too much water loss. But her research indicates that the difference between watering during the daytime and other factors like wind and um, other weather conditions, it kind of makes it a wash. So whether you irrigate day or night, you're not losing any more water and it largely has to do with wind and when it is most windy in your area. So that's, you know, I jokingly call that part of the Mythbusters series of research that we're conducting. We're kind of going back to some of those old recommendations and seeing where did that information come from. Um, in the case of day and night watering, there was no research basis for that recommendation. And so that's why that project was conducted. So preliminary results are it does not make a difference. Cool. And yeah. as soon as Melanie is done with that, we are going to have her back on the webinar. Yes, um, that'd be terrific. If you go back through the CUL YouTube channel about a year ago, uh, she was on and gave um, some preliminary, bleh, preliminary results, which were really, it was a really good presentation. So I highly recommend watching that. Um, okay, so back to the turf grass trials that, that you're doing on campus. Mm -hmm. um, why, can you just explain why it's a monoculture? So why it's just one grass type versus, uh, versus a mix? That's a great question. And I think there are some misconceptions out there in the world about what a monoculture is. Um, a monoculture would be one plant, one variety, and that's it. And so we don't ever test a true monoculture. What we, well, that's not true. We do test individual varieties for their drought tolerance, but then though in the practical world, those might then be combined together so that you could have a low water use mixture or blend of species and varieties. And so they have to be tested as monocultures so we know what the absolute water requirement is of them as an individual species or variety but the practical use is not as a monoculture. There is no one out there selling sod that is one species, one variety. It is at a minimum of blend of varieties and very often a mixture of species as well as varieties. Now, I'm gonna give my own yard as an example here because I've talked with a lot of folks about this this summer. So in my yard, uh, the turf area, it does include several different varieties, but it also includes a lot of weeds. And for me personally, that is not an issue. I don't mind having a lot of weeds. For me, the bigger factor is, can I just keep it even um, and tidy looking? For me, that's the main factor. So my yard is actually quite diverse and that is the case in most yards that I see. So I'm getting a little nitpicky with the word monoculture but we don't use monocultures of turf grass in the real world. 
Great, thank you. So you mentioned that one of USU's cultural practices is to aerate and top dress. Um, mm. Can you give some advice on preference for top dress material? Oh gosh, well, there's a zillion options out there. Um, we, so for example, with the turf trade program in Salt Lake City, we top dressed with compost and that compost came from the landfill. Um, and that's available for many landfills as well. They'll often take yard waste from the citizens in a community, compost it, and then sell it back to them. <laughs> now I'm thinking about that, I'm laughing. But anyway, it's that's one option. Um, there are lots of other options out there available in the marketplace. I've seen it done with peat moss. I've seen it done with sand. Um, it just depends on what you have available to you. But generally speaking, what you want to do is add some kind of organic material. So, you know, it's largely dependent on what's available to you locally, but at least in our case, adding organic material is a really good practice to get into because our soils tend to be so low in organic matter content. And we always want to increase that because of the positive effect it has on the water holding capacity of our soils. So I'm not getting very specific there, but I would suggest that you focus on organic amendments for top dressing. Great, thank you. So um, a couple of the questions are alluding to this, and I know I've gotten a lot of phone calls on mixing like clover or, mm -hmm. or other yeah. nitrogen pictures in with the lawn. Have you guys done research projects related to that in water use? Yes, yes, absolutely. In fact, um, I have a PhD student who's finishing up, oh gosh, she'll be finishing up this fall, and her whole project has been about incorporating clovers into turf grass areas. And the idea, this is not a new idea at all. There was a time when that was very commonly done. You might go to buy grass seed and it would include clover. Um, and so it kind of fell out of favor for a long time, but it's certainly coming back in, which is why we're looking at it. And the idea is that as the person mentioned, you know, clovers can fix nitrogen. And if we can find a way to integrate clovers and grasses, then perhaps we can have nitrogen supplied to the system by the clovers in support of the turf grass, but then we still have the functionality of the turf grass because while clover is lovely and I have nothing against clover, it's not gonna stand up to foot traffic, pets, et cetera. So that's why we're trying to approach it from sort of a mixture uh, standpoint and try to identify how to manage systems like that so that we can maintain the clover and the turf together. So um, we don't have that those results to share just yet, but we will very shortly. How heat tolerant is it? Would it be an option for places like St. George? The clover? Yeah. By itself or mixed? Uh, mixed. I think it could be. Um, they'd be looking, we've just been focusing on Kentucky bluegrass so far, but they might be thinking, or should be, I, sh I want to say, should be thinking about warm season grasses. So things like um, Bermuda grass or buffalo grass or um, blue grama. Those are grasses that are warm season grasses that do much better in that part of the state. And those could be mixed with, with clover. I'm sure of it. It would just be a question of identifying which clovers, which is part of the process we've gone through, and then identifying the management practices that, again, allow you to maintain both together. That's always the trick. That's even the trick sometimes with having mixtures of different turf grass species. Gotcha. Well, I'm looking forward to having you back on. <laughs> yeah, happy to. Um, well, cool. Well, if there are, looks like we've answered all of our questions. Um, Kelly, I really appreciate your time. Um, again, if you guys could please fill out the survey that auto, auto generates, and I will email out. Um, I know in the comment box or in the chat box, Larry Rupp mentioned a uh, turf field day that's coming up at the end of the month. So I will email that information to you guys, as well as the CEU information. And uh, give me a few days and then we'll get this up on YouTube as a refresher. Go ahead. Candid, Candace, I see one more question in the chat and yeah. it is have you studied bee, bee lawns? So we haven't studied bee lawns at USU, but I am aware of some bee lawns that have been studied at the University of Arkansas. So I think if you searched that, you know, just University of Arkansas and bee lawns, you could find some information on that. Awesome, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, well, you guys enjoy the rest of your Tuesday. Kelly, thank you again for your time. And you're welcome. We'll see you all next month. Okay, thanks everybody. Bye. Bye-bye.